Welcome to episode 54 of the G2 on 5G. It's the latest Insight scoop on everything 5G. We cover six topics in about 15 minutes, and it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. I'm Will Townsend, and joining me again this week is fellow analyst Anshul Sag. Let's get started with my first topic. So Vodafone Germany announced this week that they established a 5G and a 6G research facility in Dresden, Germany. You know, can this uh, enable a competitive advantage for Vodafone? Um, I think it can potentially. Um, our firm, and you participated in this as well, Angela, I remember about a year and a half ago, we wrote a series of articles on who's leading in 5G at the time. And I pointed out Vodafone as you know, an up and comer. And certainly when you think about Germany and that market, and you think about the automotive complex, um, and you think about one of the biggest poster child use cases for 5G being um, autonomous driving, um, certainly this uh, could be an advantage for them. And I mean, it's not new. I mean, lots of operators op um, operate, you know, 5G labs, certainly in the US, AT&T and Verizon do, and T-Mobile is beginning to spin up some customer, you know, additional customer experience labs. And certainly the infrastructure providers like Ericsson and Nokia and others do the same thing. But uh, I do think this could provide them a competitive advantage. So I don't know if you caught the news, but do you have any thoughts? I, I did not catch the news, but um, it does make sense. I, I think this is definitely more of a 6G play. Mm -hmm. um, I think as far as 5G research goes, um, a lot of that has already been done. Um, so I think it'll most likely be something in release 18 at the very earliest, mm -hmm. um, which still, you know, isn't even really in, in, in movement yet um, due to the delays of 17. So I think it will mostly be a 6G play here. And I think it's more of the, you know, Vodafone kind of acknowledging that um, they should be a little bit more on the forefront of these things. Mm -hmm. But the reality is they're still part of the, you know, the standards organizations um, and they're doing a lot of this, you know, t early testing of the 5G. So I think this is probably more geared towards 6G simply because they've already been so deeply involved in 5G. Yeah, no, that's a great observation, you know, and lots of, you know, there are lots of, you know, you know, organizations that are kicking the tires on 6G. I mean, certainly the 3GPP will set that standard. So it's very early. But I think that's that's excellent insight that it's likely more 6G focused. But let's uh, move to your first topic this week. You want to talk about Deutsche Telekom and some interoperability testing that they're conducting. Yeah, so this was a 5G Voner call. Uh, for those who don't know what Voner is, it's voice over NR, which is the 5G version of voice over LTE, which is called Volti. Um, so this is called Voner, and what it does is it basically, it does voice over 5G NR. Mm -hmm. As such, it allows for a standalone um, 5G network to handle voice and data, um, because without Voner, you can't actually do 5G standalone. Mm -hmm. um, you need Voner, and you need to make sure that there's good interoperability between users who have different device 5G devices, as well as different 5G infrastructure. So yeah. uh, what they did was they ran a test using uh, Ericsson 5G core, um, and then some IMS equipment from Nokia. Uh, and then they took two different uh, smartphones, a Galaxy S21 5G and a Xiaomi Mi 11 5G and did a test call between those two devices, which were both admittedly Snapdragon devices, um, but they were different chipsets. One was a 780G and one was an 888 5G. Um, so there were different chipsets used there. Um, and it, it's good because it, you know, it, it combines Ericsson, Nokia, Qualcomm, Samsung, and Xiaomi equipment to enable a complete and uh, you know, compliant solution to ensure that things will work as, as necessary when the 5G standalone transition happens. Cool, awesome. Well, let's move to my second topic this week. Um, Ericsson introduced a new private 5G networking kit or bundle, you know, and the question is, can this help simplify, you know, you know deployments of private networking? This is a subject that, you know, I think you, you know that I, that I kind of weigh in on, you know, quite a bit. And um, 
have spent time with, you know, lots of other, you know, um, operators and infrastructure providers as they're sort of considering, you know, how to roll out, you know, private networking. And certainly it's, from my perspective, it's going to be a mix of, you know, you know, municipalities and schools and hospitals that are able to, you know, to lease or purchase their own spectrum through things like CBRS. Um, but then also they're going to be, you know, sort of managed service, you know, as a service, you know, offerings and plays as well. But uh, this isn't new for Ericsson. Um, they've offered kits in the past. I think what this does is it sort of strengthens and broadens their portfolio to be a little more competitive with Nokia. I mean, honestly, from my perspective, when I look at all four of the, the traditional infrastructure providers, um, Nokia is, is how to lead with respect to their focus, you know, within private network. And so I think um, th this actually bolsters, you know, their, their capabilities and their competitiveness. And, and certainly by providing turnkey kits, um, it will make it simpler for enterprises that actually want to do the heavy lifting and deploy, you know, the infrastructure on-prem to do it. So I don't know if you have any thoughts or, or insights there as well. I but don't have a specific thought, but I do have a question for you. Yeah. Do you know approximately how much more quickly this bundle would enable somebody to roll out a private network rather than if they piecemealed the solution? Um, from my perspective, looking at looking at what um, Ericsson has put together with you know with blueprints and that sort of thing, you know, my initial take on it is that this could um, definitely speed the deployment. And you know, and, and that last kit that they introduced was was nearly you know nine or plus months ago, and so certainly there are probably you know you know software you know updates you know virtualization updates as well that could speed the agility of uh, of the deployment as well. So it, it definitely looks like it's a refresh um, to the portfolio. So that that's my, that's my assumption at first glance for sure. But great question. Um, let's move to your second topic this week, and you want to talk about um, a 2.5 gigahertz auction fight between AT&T and DISH. Yeah, so it's actually AT&T and DISH are opposing T-Mobile from acquiring any more 2.5 okay. gigahertz spectrum, which yeah. they currently already have. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. in some markets, they have almost 200 megahertz. So yeah. um, I think the, 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 the goal here is that um, others want in um, and they want the ability to um, prevent T-Mobile from acquiring more mm -hmm. um, simply because they already have so much. Um, but what I find interesting is that um, it feels like AT&T wants this more than DISH does, mm -hmm. um, just because I feel like um, AT&T is more likely to want to use the spectrum, while DISH um, has a history of sitting um, on spectrum, <laughs> squatting or sitting on spectrum. So right. um, I I'm not really sure what the situation is at this point. Yeah. Um, but it seems interesting that uh, AT and T and Dish, which are competitors, have have teamed up, and I find it interesting that Verizon uh, actually supports T-Mobile's position uh, on this um, spectrum uh, auction for additional 2.5 gigahertz spectrum. So um, we'll see what happens. Um, but the thing is, is that T-Mobile is currently in the position to have all of it. So um, I'm not really sure what the, what will end up happening, um, but I think T-Mobile so far has proven that they um, are being very aggressive with their 2.5 gigahertz rollout mm -hmm. and that it it is a core of their network um, and it would be very difficult for them to, uh, you know, not want to acquire more yeah. or keep what they have. Right, right. You know, you may remember because you've got a memory like a steel trap, but, um, you know, there were a lot of concessions that came together when when T-Mobile, you know, was in the throes of acquiring Sprint. And uh, there were a lot of things that were, you know, sort of um, not given, but, you know, afforded DISH an opportunity like, you know, like their, their you know, their um, prepaid, you know, prepaid business that, that spun out of Sprint. Now, 
I do recall also that there were some spectrum assets that had to be, you know, digested, right? Do you, do you recall what, what those assets were that, that DISH acquired from, from that? I believe those were low band. I want to okay. say those were sprint. So, so not mid band. No, it wasn't any mid band. I believe okay. it was somewhere in the 800 megahertz range, if I recall correctly. Okay. Um, it might've even been some like, um, 1700 or something, but for the most part, I believe it was an 800 megahertz band um, because T-Mobile already has a bunch in the seven and 600. So they don't really right. need to have 800. Yeah. Um, but it also was designed to give DISH a coverage that they would need um, to have a nationwide network, yeah. uh, which they are still in the process of building. They are, uh, and they're claiming they'll be the first to build a cloud native, fully virtualized uh, you know, network. And so uh, and lo lots of people are, are helping them with that, the hyperscalers, uh, you, know, the, you know, the infrastructure providers, even the Cisco's of the world as well. And Cisco participated with Rakuten and helping them build out their highly virtualized cloud native network in Japan. So we'll keep, uh, we'll keep tabs on that and report back. Um, let's hit my third and final topic this week. And I found this really interesting. So uh, BT in Europe is trialing the use of the new fiber optic cable in the hopes that that will improve its 5G network performance. Uh, is this claim full of hot air? And, and that's a little bit of a pun because this, this fiber is called hollow core fiber. And it's mm -hmm. actually, it's actually has an air pocket, you know, built into the, uh, the, the, the fiber cable. And um, again, you know, it's just, you know, beginning to be trialed right now by BT, but the belief is that this, uh, this new type of fiber cable um, can improve performance and and actually enhance and reduce latency as well. And obviously, the benefits for that are you know are immense when you you start looking at you know some of the very uh, disruptive you know five G services that we expect. But uh, I don't know if you caught this, but uh, what what do you think about that? Is it are, I, they, full, are they full of hot air? <laughs> I did not hear about this, but it sounds interesting. I, I guess yeah. my question is, does it improve or hinder the 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 rigidity of the fiber? Good point. Um, I think that would be an interesting thing to figure out. But, yeah. um, you know, fiber optics are no joke. Um, it's very complicated technology. Yeah. And uh, I know it's a very expensive one to deploy, mostly because of the digging. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm always excited to see, you know, what, what can improve fiber optic performance for 5G and other telecommunications, but especially 5G. Yeah. Yeah. I don't profess to be an expert. You know, I, I know enough to be dangerous with, you know, transport networks and optical and spend plenty of time with, you know, with leaders in that space, like, uh, like Nokia and Cisco, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this trial rolls out and, uh, uh, you know, as things update, you know, I'll, I'll bring that back into the podcast, but let's go hit your third and final topic this week. And you want to talk about Italy and Malaysia and they're set to, and, and I read this as well. Um, that they're set to deploy Huawei with some restrictions, right? Yeah, so what I saw is that um, they are going to be, Huawei will be approved to be a vendor for 5G in Malaysia and Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like in Malaysia, there are no um, restrictions. Okay. Uh, the uh, government officials said that they didn't see any, um, any reason for concern. Uh, or any security vulnerabilities that, that they were concerned about. Yeah. Uh, however, the Italian government did put some restrictions on Huawei, um, stating that they uh, need to meet a high security threshold um, and that they will you know, be monitored a little bit more closely. Um, but this is good news for Huawei because you know, it's been a lot of bad news for them yeah. this year. Um, and we'll see which operators uh, end up deploying with Huawei equipment, um, but there are some bright spots in Huawei's um, 5G rollout uh, mm -hmm. in, in countries that are well known to, to have fairly good 5G networks. So yeah. um, we'll see who uses it, but uh, this is just a nice little bit of good news for Huawei in terms of being able to actually get some governments to approve their, their network uh, infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, you know, they've invested quite a bit in the cybersecurity transparency centers. Um, they have one in Brussels. They have one in Shenzhen where their, their corporate headquarters are located. Um, so th they're trying to do all the right things and be transparent about it. Um, 
I'm I'm not surprised to see a country like Malaysia, um, you know, uh, you know, roll the dice um, because um, just of the, the you know kind of the the economic you know you know characteristics of of that country. Um, it's very agrarian, and and certainly that they would invite you know lower cost infrastructure. And to your point, Huawei has proven to be you know pretty resilient and very high quality um, in in their various deployments. Italy did surprise me because I really thought that you know as a core you know part of the EU that they would they would follow suit with what we're seeing in the United Kingdom and you know other parts of Europe, but. Uh, I mean, do you think this could be a domino effect for Huawei if, if they're successful in these two geographies? Do you think this could open up more opportunity for them? Uh, I think it might. Um, I also think it'll ultimately come down to what the geopolitical situation turns into. Sure. Um, you know, I think ultimately a lot of this boils down to geopolitical uh, alliances. Because mm -hmm. um, I think if the US government wasn't pushing this, um, I think a lot of countries wouldn't have sought it, sure. um, but I do think that if Italy does deploy it, um, it will be interesting to see what other countries could follow in Europe. So I think there is there is some validity in in your statement that there could be you know other dominoes to fall after this. Yeah, awesome. Well, hey buddy, another great episode this week. Uh, why don't you take us home? Absolutely. We hope our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting. If anyone out there would like to provide insights on a specific 5G podcast for a future week, uh, please reach out to us on social media. Will is at Will Town Tech and I'm at Anshul Sog. We hope you have a great weekend and please tune in again next week.